Hello, Salt Strong Nation. Joe Simons, like diamonds. We are back. Got my boy Wyatt. What's up, dude? What's going on, Joe? How you doing, boss? Oh boy, this is gonna this is gonna be controversial in here. We're talking about the best saltwater fishing pier in America, maybe even the world, maybe even the universe. So we just finished up a pier fishing mastery course. It has been certainly the most highly requested master course if you guys don't know we have master classes if you will they're online courses it's 20 years of knowledge in most cases boil down to let's just say two sometimes a three hour course i mean literally getting 20 years of like on the water experience and all these shortcuts all the mistakes that have been made by anglers for certain types of species or types of fishing in this case pier fishing and this is going to be an epic 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 course and we'll talk a little bit about some of the things learned why it was there really kind of being the director slash producer we had a videographer and editor and all that great stuff and we had this decision on what pier to pick to film the majority of this you know upcoming mastery course and um there was one pier that kind of kept rising to the top of perhaps the best saltwater fishing pier in america can you guys guess yeah. what it is? Can you guess what it is? <laughs> so with an N, we can we can give them a little bit of a, an area to look at. We had five piers to choose from, uh, from kind of the Alabama Gulf Shores region all the way to Panama. There's a lot of piers in that area, but there's one that stands out. And uh, I guess I'll just go ahead and spoil it. It was Navar Pier. Yeah. And we're going to get into the specifics, but this pier is just legendary in terms of the amount of species that you can catch and whenever we film a mastery course if you guys have ever seen any of them we try to go over as much information as possible literally cover everything you could ever ask and it just was a no-brainer to choose navarre because it opened up the most opportunities to teach about all the different species i mean you'll catch everything from whiting uh at that pier to sailfish like there is so many different species in that span that you can get into. And it was incredible how many different fish we got into while filming the course. Like it wasn't just standing on the pier talking, like as we were giving these lessons, you know, our host who is like pier fishing royalty, we'll get into that in a second, was able to like teach and show at the same time, all these tactics in action. It was incredible. Even what blackfin tuna caught while you guys were there and massive bull redfish. Uh, I, I was I was blown away. Um, so let's talk about that. You uh, you were there for the whole week uh, filming every day, trying to get every possible angle, not in terms of a camera angle, but every angle of of, of different types of fishing, different types of species, different types of rigs, literally everything you would need to know. And, and just as importantly, all the stuff to avoid and what parts of a pier to avoid fishing, right? And not, not all parts of the pier are created equal. Not all piers are created equal. And uh, like, talk about that. I know it was a learning experience for, uh, for you. Uh, who was the special guest or the host? And, uh, and, and what did you learn in particular? Right. So we were very blessed to have Brant Peacher, who some of you may follow him along on YouTube. It's Angler Rope with Brant. And reason we call him Peer Fishing Royalty is his dad literally wrote the book on peer fishing. I'm talking this guy fished Navarre Pier like his whole life and taught Brant everything. And then Brant goes out and, you know, he's kind of the next generation of teacher through YouTube and through online content. So he's taken everything that his dad taught him, combined it with like modern technology, like, like Brant's been dropping GoPros under the peers to learn like everything that he could, as well as just, you know, getting out there and gathering data uh, from just multiple days on the water, seeing how fish behave and just hearing this, you know, knowledge, like stuff that was so ingrained in him and, and having him break down, like, you know, asking just the why questions to stuff that's second nature to him, like, oh, why, why would you want to fish this season for this specific fish? Or why are they not going to bite on this specific wind? Like stuff that's just ingrained in him. He's like, you know, no one's ever asked me that question. I've never talked about that, but there is definitely a thought process behind all these approaches. So, like you said, no two parts of the pier are created equal. 
peers and, and in the course, you'll see we really separated the peer into three different parts. And a lot of people just look at a peer as, you know, you go out and you throw a line and that's not the case. You really need to pick your targets and understand the zone that you're in. So those three parts of the peer uh, that are in the course are going to be the surf zone, which a lot of you guys might surf fish and be frustrated that you can't reach, you know, the outsides of bars or things. Maybe tide restricts you from getting to a certain target area. The pier allows you to fish every angle of the surf zone. So from the wash that's on the beach to the outside sandbars that you could literally never cast to. And Brant broke down all the different species in the surf zone, all the different ways you can target them. Um, and then that leads into the next section of the pier, which we called no man's land. And that's just a name we gave it because you can actually catch a lot of fish there, but you don't see a lot of people spend time there. And it's an overlooked area because you can get onto Spanish mackerel. I mean, we caught probably all the Spanish mackerel on the course came from no man's land. And we did a bunch of great sight fishing. Like I got a shot of Brant cat sight casting at Pompano off this pier in no man's land. You can literally see the Pompano school coming up. He throws the jig into there, jigs it a couple of times. And then those Pompano come up and slam it. And he's, you know, pulling Pompano over the rail left and right. Uh, it was really, uh, there's so many opportunities out in no man's land as well. And then you've got what we called the bullpen at the end. And this is like, probably the most intimidating area for a new angler but uh it's also where like the biggest game species are caught navarre again is very unique in that it's very close to really deep water so it it there's so many piers in the country that you can get some really nice big game species on i mean i fished johnny mercer's pier in uh, in north carolina and you know there's king mackerel that are caught there's bonita that are caught um, but Navarre is just so close to that deep water. Those opportunities happen there every day. So our first thing every day that we went and filmed, um, for that week that we were there was there, it's just the time of year and Brant broke it down in the course that, you know, Bonita are going to have about an hour run, uh, first thing in the morning. So every morning we went out there and we caught these tuna that are right off the end of the pier. And, you know, you've got 20 guys out there casting and it's, it's controlled chaos, but everyone kind of knows what's going on. Brant broke down all the rules in the course. Like there's a certain way to fish around a crowd of people. And it's cool to see everyone work together as a team and kind of learn the ins and outs of, you know, there's a very specific way to fight a fish around a bunch of people and there's rules that go with it. But um, to, to see how, you know, the dynamics of like a bullpen will work. Uh, it, it was cool to have him break that down and see, you know, these tuna flying over the rail left and right, you know, black fins are getting pulled in and and hearing people shout out, you know, that there's different games, game fish species coming in. It's a, uh, it's, it's cool that the pier is, it provides opportunities for the individual angler, but it's, it's almost like fishing with a team. Um, it's, it's a really unique experience. And I can confidently say we covered like, all aspects of those three zones in the course. But I would say by far my favorite part was the bullpen, like going down and filming in there because there was just something cool happening every time we went down there. That is so cool. All right. So you said his dad wrote the book. Do you mean literally wrote a book on pier fishing? Yes, literally wrote the book. I, I'll have to get the title and we'll put the, the link below. But his dad actually wrote a book on pier fishing. And it's like, I think at the time of the book, he'd, he'd fished the pier for 20 years um, and he shared like all his experiences in there. Um, I don't know exactly how old the book is now, but there's, it, I mean, it's jam packed with info and, and that's stuff that like Grant just learned, you know, he was going out there as a kid learning this stuff, catching fish that were bigger than him while he was a kid. Uh, his dad's just teaching him how to do all this stuff. And then, you know, he goes out uh, now that he's the teacher in that role and uh it's funny he was telling us a story about how his dad was like i don't really get the youtube stuff you know he was telling brant he should write a book as well but now brant's out there getting you know recognized by all these people because he's got the youtube channel so it's it's funny to see how that teacher role has moved through the years where if you wanted to get information on pier fishing you had to be friends with you know we call them pier rats guys that are at the pier every day they get a day off they're spending their whole day in the bullpen looking for that cobia that's going to swim by um and and to get the knowledge now you go and you go through a course or you see the online content and it, it's cool to bring that that gap together um with brant so yeah his dad literally wrote the book but now we're getting the next step which is providing the technology that you know brant has used to learn a little bit more about these fish 
with a lot of the old school tactics that you just learn from day in, day out on the pier uh, and, and combining all that together to just really have a comprehensive, really good wealth of knowledge about, you know, how to structure a game plan around pier fishing. When um, I think it was right when you were done and I had asked like, what was, what was like an aha moment or maybe a variable you didn't think about uh, what, what's the answer? I would say that, for me, being I, I've fished a lot of piers, and I just thought it was you had to kind of know what was running at the at the time and uh, at the time of year that you were trying to go fish, and it was like okay, you know, you just go out and you try and target that species because that's the time of year. That's not the case at all um, because you do have these three zones on the pier. There's different opportunities throughout each season, and there's actually like when we filmed the the surf fishing course, you know, Bama beach bum was there and he was completely straightforward. And he was like, you know, winter's a tough time fishing the beach. There's not a whole lot of opportunities. And I thought the same thing would happen. Like I was kind of dreading getting to the winter portions of the course with Brant where it was like, man, there's not really a whole lot to talk about in winter. I would assume, you know, and he's like, no, 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 no. Winter is like one of the best times of year. So I was like, so what you're saying is, Hey, and as we went through each season, you know, he always had a really big highlight to focus on, what I heard was there is always opportunities on the pier and not just that, but you really can approach the pier from a standpoint that you are not just going out to target one fish. You look at the conditions for that day and there's, there's so much that can happen in those three zones, depending on the season. There's, there's so much that you can go out there and do. So I went to the pier so many days and, you know, if I heard the Spanish mackerel were running, you know, I'd call the pier and say, Hey, what's happening? Uh, that's what I would go out and try and fish for. But Brant really broke down that you need to obviously understand the season, what what would be running that time of year, but also look at conditions because that can bring certain species in that people might not expect. And if you're the only one that's prepared for them, you know, you also are getting a first shot at those fish uh, because while you are working as a team, if that one cobia swims by and it's, you know, it, it, everyone wants to cast at it, uh, you're the one that's prepared for it. You're going to get that first shot. So my big aha moment was that you really can look at the pier and understand that there is a game plan depending on conditions and analyzing what's happening uh, instead of just, you know, maybe something's maybe something's going to run by the pier at this time of year. You can approach it and have a lot of different opportunities uh, just by understanding like the ins and outs of each species. And again, that just comes from local knowledge. Uh, I'm sorry, not local. Someone that's been on the pier a lot and seen so many different things happen and gathered all that data. Uh, that was a big aha moment for me because I thought I was pretty good at pier fishing and I, I was really just taking a, a generalist approach to it. But to see Brant approach it almost how I approach bay fishing uh, was it was cool to see that scientific method be applied. That's cool. Uh, talk about the importance of wind. Right. That was another... Yes. Another huge aha moment for me. Uh, I knew wind was important, but I thought tide was a much bigger factor. And when talking to Brant, you know, regardless of whatever pier you go to, you do get tide swings because you are on the beach. So even if, you know, you're in areas of Florida that you hear there's not big tide swings, we talk about this uh, when we cover bay fishing in the community a lot is that some areas don't have big tidal flow, you know, areas up in the Northeast, East Coast, they get big tide swings, but there's always big tide swings on the beach, regardless of where you live. So tide does play a factor. And I figured that that would be probably the most important part. Like as we got into teaching those modules and, and discussing with Brant how we teach him, he goes, well, wind is a way bigger factor. And that really made me think about how I would structure game plans. And he got into all the different things that wind can affect. It brings in different bait species. It brings in different types of opportunities for species. A lot of big game targets um, that I would just, you know, I, I would assume would not certain winds. He's like, you know, these are the best times that they're going to, you're going to get opportunities. I mean, he even told us the best wind for tuna species, like to have him dial down that this is when they're going to come in. And, you know, he showed me these dates that this was occurring and he'd show me pictures of these days. I mean, there is a very consistent, consistent pattern uh, with how certain species behave uh, with wind, even knowing when the water is going to be dirty, which that's another big thing that I learned was dirty water does not mean bad pier fishing. In fact, Brent was saying that's one of his favorite times to get out on the pier for big game. It's like these fish aren't as aware of what's going on. You can catch them a lot easier. He said, you know, I like, I like tarpon fishing when it's dirty water. Uh, we actually hooked a tarpon during the course as well. It was, I mean, there's so many, 
so many little things that I got to hear from him experiencing out on the pier and him being so surefire confident uh, and having results to show me um, that you can just, you can structure your day around whatever the conditions are. So you got certain winds, certain tides, certain times of year, uh, different opportunities for so many different fish. And you guys covered, it sounds like all four seasons. Right. We went through spring, summer, fall, and winter. And even though maybe you pull it up, I know people, um, enjoy seeing other things besides our beautiful faces. Uh, but we'll pull it up for the people watching the video. I'll actually show the Navarre pier, maybe a couple other close by. And I know why it spends some time in, uh, in North Carolina and has obviously been in, in Texas and there's piers in all these States. Um, well, there it is. That would be Navarre pier right there. This is a little bit of a, a tough image, but I'm going to switch it. Thanks to smart fishing spots. You got a couple oh, yeah. of different views on here that you can see. But again, to kind of talk about three different zones of the pier, you know, obviously you've got surf zone out to this first bar and depending on the pier that you're on, uh, you know, that bar might come out a little bit further. It might be a little bit further in uh, and the bars do change uh, depending on, you know, if you have a big storm or something, it might move them closer to the beach. It all changes. But uh, th this pier is really cool because you can see the proximity to deeper water. Yeah. Uh, a lot of piers that come out, they these drop-offs don't happen this close this is why you get you know mahi that get caught out here and those big tuna blitzes that happen that you know they're basically pushing bait up against the beach along this ridge uh we got some drone footage of a, a school of menhaden that were getting blown up on by some of these tuna schools and it was a you know the, the school is almost as long as the pier and it's these are all highly migratory species so to have a pier that sits on just basically a giant highway for migratory species like tuna and mackerel and, you know, other pelagics. Um, that's why this pier, again, I think is the best pier in the world, I would say, because it opens up so many opportunities, but so, but the, uh, like the amount of fish that you can catch here, you've got big bull reds, pompano in the surf zone. Uh, you've got your mackerel species and the, the, the pompano you, you can sight fish again no man's land and then uh in the bullpen down over here you've got all those big game species but if we take a look you know at some of these other piers if i was to scroll a little further down let's see we got one right here again you can see it's it, this pier is not very far off from that last one but it's still it's not on the edge of that drop off so if there's you know tuna schools that are pushing bait they're never going to get close enough for you to cast to uh Brant was telling me that this was a good tarpon pier. Uh, there, and again, different piers open up different opportunities. And it's just the way that he taught tarpon in the course, you can see why this would be a little bit more conducive to that. But look at that dark spot on the left. You see it? Yeah. Yes. Is yes. That a shark or something? <laughs> it looks no, nice. that, that would probably be. So a lot of these piers have been hit by hurricanes and destroyed. And in fact, uh, if I go back over to navarre this is another great reason why or this is another reason why i would i would argue this is a uh, one of the best piers in the country is that this pier that got destroyed um this pier was i think it was 2004 or something like that uh ivan destroyed it and they rebuilt it and they actually took a lot of the you know wreckage and and demolition from that pier and dropped it along these areas to kind of get some fish closer so you've always got bait and life and activity around this pier uh some of the other piers have done that i would assume that that pier we were just looking at which i believe this is um okaloosa i think this is okaloosa i could be wrong but that might be an old part of okaloosa or it's a a, a seagrass patch i'm not 100 percent sure cool but in this course although it was filmed in navarre it applies everywhere you guys i know spent a lot of time uh talking about the different types of peers the things they have in common because they do have things in common the things that are different and how you can apply the same knowledge and obviously they talked a lot about rigs and different baits uh and and like you said the seasons and the wind directions that you could apply it regardless if you're here in the panhandle or if you're in south florida or the carolinas or you know all the way up in in new jersey i don't know, maybe not new jersey uh but uh I, i'm being sarcastic there but uh, yeah. literally, it could apply anywhere. 
Right. And it, that was something that we talked about because when we first started, you know, filming the course, he, he'd fished on so many different piers, uh, you know, even on the east coast of Florida up into the Carolinas. Yep. Uh, he's, he's fished on so many different piers and to have he, he started to kind of segment it into certain wins for each region. And I was like, man, that's going to take a long time to talk about. Why don't we just focus on the concept? So instead of, you know, what specific wins would be good at, say, Navarre Pier, we got into a discussion on why those winds were so good. So for example, those tuna species, he highlighted that onshore winds would be really good. So instead of saying, you know, say a south wind would be good to fish because someone that's in North Carolina, south wind is different to Navarre Pier, uh, where that's onshore, south wind in North Carolina, that's going to be a crosswind. And we talked about crosswinds as well. So having him use terms like crosswind or, you know, onshore, offshore wind, we we broke down the concept more than just this is the specific plan for this period. Yes, everything was filmed on Navarre, but we highlighted the concept of why certain winds or why certain tactics would work, keeping in mind that people from all over the U.S. were going to watch this. Folks that are fishing, you know, Johnny Mercer's over in Wrightsville Beach, folks that are fishing, you know, Okaloosa, folks that are fishing over in Gulf, like all the different big piers that you see in the U.S., um, we talked about the concepts, not just what worked at this specific pier. Uh, we made sure that what we covered was for everyone because he's fished everywhere. And uh, even just talking about fish migrations, you know, we got into how fish might migrate differently in certain different parts of the country. Um, and we went over everything, everything possible to make sure that we could we could really get our bases covered. That's cool. On the tackle side, I'm curious I know you guys did a lot of actual fishing, not just teaching or you're fishing while you taught. Um, live bait versus lures. Um, what percentage was he using, you think? Oh, man, I would say it was probably about 50 50. Uh, I mean, a lot of the big redfish that we caught, and you need to, again, adjust your tactics depending on time of year and certain fish that you're dealing with because. I know we say a redfish is a redfish, but a schooling redfish is different than a residential redfish and a migrating cobia is different than a residential cobia. So when Brant kind of broke down those two, it seemed like the spookier fish needed the live bait presentations and the migrating fish were a lot less picky and you could use lures and there was efficiency to both of them. Um, but what surprised me was how simple the tackle was. When I used to roll to the pier, uh, I would bring a backpack full of trays of lures because um, I felt like I needed a lot of different, you know, things to throw and be ready for different species. I mean, I think there's probably five or six different lures you could bring out to the pier and a small set of terminal tackle uh, and you will be able to catch everything there. Uh, and it was really cool to see how, concise Brant was able to make his you know tackle loadouts um it, it's it's really important i think as fishermen that we downsize all the stuff that we bring out and I, i've gotten pretty good about this inshore but you know when i go to the pier i i guess because i've not been out there as much uh as Brant has i had more stuff i was bringing it was a little bit frustrating to kind of keep up with all the different presentations i needed to have ready but when he broke down how you can make small adjustments to a retrieve or small adjustments to what hook size you're using to, to convince fish to bite um, and, and just adjusting little things, it was cool to see how simple he made the approach to tackle. Uh, our, our tackle section was, out of all the courses and tips that I've filmed, one of the more concise and just straightforward uh, presentations that we've had because... Yeah. It, it's more about just being ready and understanding what you're targeting than this is the magic lure for this fish. Um, I would say that if you had to go out there and just catch anything on the pier, like it was cool to see how many fish a gotcha jig would catch or a pompano jig. I mean, we caught Spanish mackerel. We caught remora. I had a remora. We tried to stick to my forehead uh, that you're caught that on a pompano yeah. jig. Yeah, I'm that guy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, the tackle was incredibly simple. That's uh, I mean – we've we've hammered that so many times right and it's probably one of the most common issues that we see is just simplify it right because you can and it, and it can get aggravating too when you've got all these different choices and then you just you almost get more frustrated when that one doesn't work and you move on to the next one versus a lot of people fish with me and they're shocked 
and and it's not the answer for everything but i usually just use the slam shaded 2.0 like even today i outfished luke yep that's right um and you know he was he moves around a little bit he's still good but he was going from power prawn to the mulligan to slam shaded 2.0 and and changed the colors a couple of times and dude i just stuck with the one thing and just kept catching consistent fish um to me that that was and i learned that from luke because the irony was i was the exact opposite he he used to always make fun of me he, you know he's like oh man which which container has all your hair gel and stuff in this because it looked like this just massive contraption of of tackle this massive bag that i would bring and uh now it's super super simple uh so i i love hearing that what else what were some other uh takeaways i know we can't give away everything because this course is not out yet uh, for our insider members to uh, to get, uh, or anyone for that matter, in the public who wants to invest in the course. Uh, but what were some other takeaways from this thing? Right. Um, so a big takeaway that I saw, uh, tactics that I were I, I have not ever implemented. So Brant gave a lot of really good tutorials on using live bait on the pier. And you might be thinking like, you know, live bait on the pier sounds a little bit difficult, uh, you know, keeping it alive and making sure that, you know, you're, you're rigging it right. Cause the pier is not like, you don't have live wells out there. Um, so he just kind of showed us how a simple shrimp, shrimp bucket with an aerator, like you have everything covered from King mackerel to Pompano. Like you can keep yeah. shrimp alive. You can catch bait. Like he showed us how to catch bait on the pier. And there was a lot of bait there. Just taking a sabiki rig out and catching little hardtails, pinfish, like all those baits work really well. Like we caught redfish, with bait that we caught at the pier so he was sitting there dropping a sabiki rig uh caught some cigar minnows we caught a pinfish uh and, and then dropped it down for those redfish uh, like th that was really cool to see those presentations because i i've definitely encountered fish on piers that i'm like there's no way those things are going to eat and uh, i know frozen shrimp's not going to work i just kind of wrote those fish off and a lot of other people that were walking down the pier that you know were the pier rats they were seeing that as well. And, you know, they're not too worried about it because they know they're residential fish. They're not going to mess with them to see how he made those presentations. Like those fish that were, that, that were just swimming around on the bottom of the pier, make them look appealing for those residential fish, like, and immediately get those redfish to eat was really cool. And there there's a lot of the, what was cool to see the intricacies of like that fish isn't going to eat this one will because it's moving this way like we were able to zoom in on these fish and show their movement patterns and have him talk about you know how you want to rig these live baits um and keeping them lively too like you know certain things you can do to keep shrimp lasting longer on the pier or certain things you can do when you're rigging to keep something more attractive to a redfish or a king mackerel or, or something of that nature simple rigs but more about the way that you present them to these fish that i had never seen before because to me handling live bait is a little bit of a struggle um and I never, it's not something I ever really thought about doing, but you know, the moment we, we brought that aerator out there, our opportunities opened up really big. And I don't see a lot of people using live bait on the pier, maybe in the bullpen uh, for King mackerel. I see, I've seen it before, but that's, you know, that's again, very big game fishing, but to see it happening in the surf zone and, and other places on the pier as well. Um, they're presentations that I've never really seen before. And, and to have him kind of break that down and walk through how to do it, like, I was, I was confident enough to go out there and start throwing for those reds as well. That's cool. Um, I'm curious hmm. about the, you know, we'll call them the pier rats, the, some of the locals. You're out there filming. You got a videographer. You got you. You got him teaching. A, any any scuffles or was everyone, I know he, he has a person has a lot of respect around there, but there's usually still one in every group that, just is super territorial what was what was that like filming uh, a course like that on a uh, and i know you guys are there during the weekdays for a chunk a chunk of it but there's still people out there every single day yeah so it was uh it was interesting um we don't normally film courses around like large crowds of people it's hard to teach when people are walking by and you get distracted from what you're saying um so that was a little bit of a, a difficulty we had to overcome thankfully you know Brant's a pro he, he knew how to stay focused with the camera um there was a couple situations i don't know if joel will create a uh 
a, a blooper reel of, you know, while Brant's teaching, someone would come in, jump in the shot and like, I want to be famous too. And it's like, <laughs> we had a bunch of situations like that. Uh -huh. um, getting down to the bullpen and like, we had a very good tutorial on, you know, if you're a new angler, what the rules of the bullpen are, spacing and everything. I probably appreciated um, that. Yeah, yeah. And uh, it, it was really cool to learn how to navigate around in there. But filming it's a different story because we're not fishing. So we don't have that same right to the rail as the other anglers do. So it was it was kind of, you know, playing it by ear. There were some mornings where we could literally get over Brant's shoulder. I mean, Joel got this amazing shot. It wasn't super crowded in the bullpen. And he's like zoomed in completely. Like, and he has a really nice camera. So it's like, you're sitting there, that top water's right in front of the screen. Like you're right there. And he's sitting there working that spoon across the surface. You see this Benita come up and just absolutely inhale the spoon and make this giant explosion. So That's like- awesome. We got some really cool shots when we were allowed to be near the rail, but there were some mornings, like as we got closer to the end of the week, especially when the black fin showed up, like Brant kind of had to pull us aside and be like, Hey, these tuna are like a religion for these guys. You can't like, we, we got to be careful this morning. We got to give them space. So it was like, there were some mornings we were having to stay a little further back. And like, we got our angles by lifting the cameras up and everything and got some good shots of how navigating works around uh when when you're at the pier but you know there there definitely as we got towards the end of the week there was a little bit of patience being lost by the locals uh with the cameras but it's understood everyone's out there trying to have a good time fishing so we stayed we stayed out of everyone's way as best we could no problems there uh thankfully but we were as respectful as we could to everyone's space um and when we did most of like the filming in front of the camera because pretty much everything except the tackle section was filmed on the pier uh you know we we tried to film away from people as 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 much as possible so that uh folks would quit jumping in front of the camera wanting their uh, their 15 minutes of fame in oh, fact so funny speaking of 15 minutes of fame we did have an australian news company come up and interview brant one day uh like it was funny we're sitting there with our cameras and like they walk up with one of the big like news ones it's like yeah. hmm, what are the chances of two big cameras being on the pier <laughs> one of these yeah. days it was uh it was interesting that's hilarious. Well, I am so pumped to see the full thing. I've seen bits and pieces and uh, yeah, it's just going to be just fantastic. I I'm curious too, because we grew up Daytona beach where our grandfather had a little condo there forever. And we used to go hit the piers up as kids and very, very fond memories. I honestly haven't done it a bunch. I haven't done it with my kids uh, just because, you know, we we've done different things. So I'm really pumped for this as well. And and some of it's just been intimidation. Some has been, you know, just because, it's easier for us to go out in the, the boat or, or weight fishing or out in the kayaks and, uh, and paddle boards. But as, as you said, there are so many different opportunities. There's so many peers and anyone can do it. Right. I mean, it, that, that's the beauty of it. Anyone can go out there. And in most cases it works year round. I mean, you can be catching fish any given day all year long. So I'm really, really pumped for this. Right. And that, that was another big thing we wanted to focus on the course about. And it was important for myself as well as Brant to highlight those opportunities for anglers that aren't as concerned about going down to the bullpen and fighting shoulder to shoulder with like locals, you know, people that just want to go out and have fun with their, their, their friends and family, you know, opportunities that are there. And we really hammered home some good things to go do. If you want to take your kids to the pier and easily put them on fish, like Brant was saying, you know, in terms of all the different types of fishing that you can do, uh, if you really want to put kids onto an easy bite fast, like we highlighted exact times of year, exact species to target things to do ways to fish with kids to make it really fun. Like if you want to, I, I think the pier is one of the best places you can go to take somebody that's not, say a super serious fisherman and show them an amazing time. Like we had dedicated videos to doing that uh, because we know that a lot of the people that are going to be watching this course, you know, the great thing about piers is you don't need a fishing license to fish on most of them there. It's provided on most of those piers. Uh, when you go and you, you buy your, your pier pass, it's almost like buying a, uh, uh, buying a charter guide um, trip and, those peers offer an opportunity for vacationers to experience fishing um, at, at a very low price. And I think that was an important piece for us was making sure that we provided really good information to folks that might not live on the coast that might be vacationing and want to kind of 
get in on a lot of that fun. And, and, you know, I think we did a great job of showcasing all the different things that you can do on the pier, even if you don't want to go down and be part of the the serious big game fishing, because you can have just as much fun catching right. Spanish mackerel, pompano, ladyfish, uh, blue, f- like we covered so much for anybody that just wants to go and have a good time with friends and family. That's awesome. Well, it's going to be good. This will uh, hopefully be out sooner than later. And there's a ton of editing to do with it. And uh, we will be giving a very special deal. Probably, I don't know, we normally go 60, 70% off when we uh, we launch it. And then we raise the price after that first couple of days. So stay tuned. Obviously, if you're a lifetime member as an insider or a VIP member, you're going to get automatically into your account. Everyone else will have to purchase it and or upgrade to VIP. If you're a member, we can help you out with that. And uh, this is going to be a fantastic one. I uh, I I was with Joel today, you know, who was just there uh, filming all week with you. And I was like, all right, I was like, tell me, dude, like, what what did you think? And he was like, dude, next level. He's like, I have so much more confidence now that I can go catch fish like any pier I go to. And he travels, he and his family vacation a lot, and just love like seeing new places. He's like, I I cannot wait to put it to to work. So, uh, really really pumped. If you guys have any questions or thoughts on any of this stuff, let us know in the comment section down below. Best place is at saltstrong.com. And of course, if you haven't joined us in the Insider Club, why? what the heck are they waiting on? I have no idea, man. There's too much good stuff in there to miss out on. Ooh, yeah, and the, the really the big news, you know, we have a lot in the Insider Club. That's how we've been able to track 35,000 members. But the really big news, in my opinion is we have taken the smart fishing game plans, which has been really the, the, the top thing that people say they just, they can't go without smart fishing spots. That's kind of a guarantee, but in terms of something unique that we're doing on the human intelligence side of things, smart fishing spots is kind of the artificial intelligence and using technology, but on the human intelligence, our coaches have been doing these smart fishing game plans where every Friday morning, in 10 minutes or less they literally show you where to catch fish in your area like it's just trends on steroids and now we're getting full-time guides in every single area every single region to do the same thing so we've just taken that up to a whole new level so in the next few months you will see someone in your area full-time guide who will be doing their smart fishing game plan and telling you in your very specific area exactly what has been working all week long. And here's the types of areas to go fishing to maximize your time. Next, next. I mean, it would be like having a fishing guide in your back pocket on speed dial that you can call at any time and say, hey, what's been biting? What should I use? What kind of area should I go to? And that's huge, right? And that's just one piece. That's one facet of the club. And I'm really excited because we've been talking about it forever and we got our boy Judd in North Carolina helping, you know, kind of align all these different guys because that's a full time job in and of itself. And uh, really, really, really pumped about that. Yeah, it's going to be incredible to have just hundreds of locations uh, with a very specific, not only like what's been happening, like the guys are going to talk about what they saw that week when they took clients out, what fish were biting, where they were holding everything as well as a forecast for the upcoming week like what to expect so i don't think there's any better like piece of information it's like calling like you said it's literally having a guide in your back pocket uh telling them you know where the fish have been what they've been hitting and what they're most likely to do uh when you go out to fish that upcoming week so i'm i'm pumped about it we're already getting a bunch of guides plugged in and uh as it grows i think it's just going to help people get on fish so much faster so that makes me really happy. I just like seeing people get out and have a good time on the yeah. water. Real time on demand, baby. So that's over at saltstrong.com. Current members, stay tuned and keep giving us feedback. All of this has happened because of you telling us what you want, things that are helpful to you. We are here to serve you. So thank you guys from the bottom of our hearts. We love you, appreciate you, and we'll talk to you on the next episode. Peace. We out.